Alrighty, hello, hello everybody, this is Kiru Show here. Now, whenever we last left off, things have been different. Mirio Toga has been brought back to Sanctuary and has seen the planet for the first time. Seeing how life on another planet has changed for the human race. There are no villains anymore. In fact, that's the thing that surprised him the most about this place. Even if there are villains who do pop up, most people just take them down. The place is truly a superhuman society, once again. But even then, it still does feel off. It doesn't feel like home. And it won't for quite a long time. However, let us do a bit more of a time skip. It has been roughly around three years since we last saw our characters. In this amount of time, a lot of things have changed. Midoriya, he, and quite a lot of other people have been working on something. They have been working on getting Ion back. As soon as they got him back, they were able to relight the core. And get things sorted out. The Green Lanterns are born once again. And with the help of new recruits and the other Lantern Corps, they have been able to actually start getting places back to their home planets. And many databases that Brainiac had, he had catalogs of places. And Midoriya took it upon himself to go through quite a lot of these. Finding the planets that Umbrax caused damage to and devastated. He himself returning them to the planets. And at least trying to make up for Umbrax. Those people, though, they still do view Midoriya as a symbol of fear. His face has been seen everywhere, although it is beginning to somewhat change. They saw him as a, well, butcher. However, this small thing has at least changed a bit of their views on him, along with their hearing the truth. Umbrax is truly gone. The man Umbrax once inhabited is trying to make up for everything. He had to save his species from a threat, doing so and then trying to help out across the universe. Now, let's cut to Midoriya, who is sitting down on a planet, who is on a planet, and set down a city as they currently begin to enlarge it. As soon as they do enlarge it though, the inhabitants of the city immediately begin to cower in fear, seeing Midoriya's face. As he begins to explain to them that things are not like how they were, and that he is not that person. However, as he does begin to explain to the citizens that their city was one of the last ones that had order on their planet. And restoring it will take some time. As he then says that two of them will be appointed with lanterns. One of the Ultraviolet Corps and one of the Green Lantern Corps. And they will be in charge and be an ambassador. They are going to be the ones who will help you the most as he does actually take flights, letting the rings do their thing, as he does begin to make his way across space, back to Sanctuary. Whenever he does arrive, he does land on the planets, and see it. 
as there are quite a bit of places around that have changed. UA is now just seen as an ordinary high school. However, they do try and help kids use and harness their quirks in different ways. What type of jobs you can do, what kind of purpose you could help serve in the community. This being seen as a training place for quirks now, not a hero school. Although there are also... Well, it was a bit of experiment, Midori thought, but it should be at least worth a try. He calls it the Lantern Corp Initiative. Every... Well, afternoon, he takes all the lanterns and gives them orders. Specific tasks they are supposed to do. How they can improve upon things along with training new recruits. Him being seen as the leader of the Green Lanterns and the Ultraviolet Lanterns. Along with that, Sophie is still around, and she's actually a bit more nervous. Everything they've done, they've changed a lot. The Green Lanterns exist. Well, that's insane. They existed in her timeline. Then there's Miryotoka. He's back. And then there's the fact that, as she goes on, her memories. Now, with that, you do have the fact that, well, our character, Mehatsume, I'm just going to say this now, in the three year span, she's learned about vast amounts of alien technology, studying everything she can find on it, and beginning to incorporate it into this super suit meaning that she will basically be the cyborg of the team. Since she has all this information packed tightly in all this tech inside of one creation. Now, with that being said, let us cut to Midoriya, who is flying back over to his house as he does land, seeing his wife Jiro along with his daughter, actually flying around and floating throughout the air. Her still trying to at least practice doing this a bit. You do see that she's not very confident on her face. However, Midoriya does float over to her and try and reassure her that she is doing perfectly fine. And she does give him a smile. Midoriya just tapping down onto the ground and going over what he's had to do. He's gained a lot of people's trust and other things. However, you do still have a few problems. Apparently, this chick called Maxima is still trying to... What's the best way to say it? She's trying to drag him back to her her city on her planet in order to give her planet an heir or a future kink. Since he is seen as Clark Kent or Superman was to her. Now, along with that, this is where the timeline is truly beginning to change. Sophie, she is currently helping out around one of these places, along with helping build new structures. As her hearing does pick up on something, her immediately looking upwards toward the sky, and beginning to use her vision, trying to zoom in, trying to find out where the source of that sound is. As she does see it in the upper atmosphere. As she does actually begin to get a bit more fearful. As she immediately just yells that he's here. Mongol is on the planet. Midoriya picking that up with his hearing. As his face goes to immediate, immediate shock and surprise. Now, Jiro is confused by that. As Midoriya... He hands over Sophie, 
and tells Jiro that he's here. Shit. This wasn't supposed to happen yet. He's early. Wh what? That that can't be. Why do you think he's here? Why now? I have a few guesses. But even then, I'm trying to think, go over everything. All right. Well, are you sure you can take him? I. I hope so. So. As Midoriya turns his head and tells Chiro that he loves her. No matter what happens, protect their daughter. If he gets infected, he's leaving. He's flying himself to the nearest black hole, possibly even going to the source wall. <sighs> Just know, this won't be the last time I see you again. As Midoriya flies off, Amelie flying towards and intercepting the ship coming into the atmosphere. As he smashes into it, this immediately surprising Mongol and Lex Luthor. Now, Midoriya flies through and grabs Mongol, bashing him and pulling him straight through the hull of the ship. As the ship begins to malfunction and falling towards the city. That being whenever quite a few people do look up and see that. As Kirishima, he hears all the screaming and commotion, running out to see what's going on. As soon as he sees the ship, he immediately yells out Shazam, and begins to make his way upwards towards it, as Sophie is flying in to catch it. Both these two doing so, and moving the ship away from the city towards a local forest, and setting it down there, as they begin to investigate it. Now, we do have... We do have Midoriya versus Mongol. After Midoriya grabbed Mongol and tore him through the ship, he immediately flew them into outer space, so as to keep them away from civilians. Now, as soon as Midoriya tore him out of the ship and threw him through the wall, Mongol did try and fight back. However, he was surprised at Midoriya's strength. Yelling that he did get a lot stronger, trying to actually fight back and punch at Midoriya. Who was able to easily dodge his punches and actually fight back with them. Along with actually elongating constructs and throwing him out there himself before flying in and smashing into him, as he himself begins to make constructs, and tries to fight with Midoriya. Mongol is trying to take Midoriya back down onto the surface, so as to demoralize his people, fueling the fear caused by them, trying to make himself stronger. He thought just taking Midoriya down would be simple, since he killed him once before. Now, with that being said, Midoriya and Mongol would begin their fight, properly. Midoriya, feeling himself being charged up since he is in outer space, closer to their sun. As he flies forward, and breaks through Mongol's constructs, as he tries to fire upon Midoriya. Him smashing through them and immediately sucker punching him in the gut, before throwing his hands upwards, smashing him directly in the head, sending him flying backwards and away, as Mongol smashes onto the moon. Midoriya immediately flying towards him, and burying him into it, the two fighting as they're being to crack it apart. Mongol being able to overpower Midoriya and grab him. Midoriya is very fast and strong. Stronger than Superman, for sure. However, Mongol is still stronger. And as he grabs onto Midoriya, he does try and bend his arm. Midoriya using his heat vision and blasting his finger and his hand before immediately punching the area affected. 
Mongol letting out a scream as he actually does try and grab Midoriya by his face. This being where the armor, it, or the god killer sword, created and turned into armor, stabbing upwards as it tries to grab Midoriya. As he tried to grab Midoriya. I'm sorry? Now, with that being said, Mongol is completely in shock at the transformation that this boy has gone through. In, a, in over five years, this young person has completely changed. As Midoriya's eyes light up with heat vision, and he lets out a large, large blast, sending Mongol flying through the other side of the moon. And they did at least punch a hole through it. Mongol getting back up as Midoriya comes flying in, grabbing him and immediately tossing him away. As Mongol recovers, getting back up and flying towards Midoriya as he creates constructs and begins to blast them outwards. Midoriya bringing up his hands and each finger being covered in the strange power. As every single motion he has goes flying out of each finger and goes towards him, them wrapping around him around in colorful constructs being able to actually smash through and destroy Mongols. As he does, fly forwards and smash into him, blasting off his heat vision at higher degrees. Now, Mongol, he is fairly impressed. And he's going to get a lot more serious against this boy. As he does, fly back in. Midoriya realizing exactly how fast Mongol truly is as he's barely able to react to the punch coming towards his face, barely being able to get out of the way before a piece of the metal around his face jabs outwards towards Mongol's hand and cuts into it. As Midoriya does actually throw out his own solid punch directly hitting Mongol in the nose, opening his hand and blasting him with pure shame. As Mongol immediately grabs the Midoriya by the back of his arm, and pulls him. Midoriya letting his entire body go along with it. Mongol pulling Midoriya close to him as Midoriya brings his legs upwards, wrapping them around Mongol's arm as he begins to try and make quick work of it. Now, back over on Earth, you do have, well, the heroes. Quote unquote. Sophie Bakugo. Karashima, Meihatsume, and Sayako. They are all investigating the ship that is in the forest. And trying to understand what is going on with this. As Lex Luthor does eventually walk out of it. Sophie immediately seeing the man. And going to blast him with her heat vision. As it goes towards him. This is whenever a shield pops up, blocking the blast as Luther tells them all that they are fairly mistaken. And that the only way to survive is to succumb to the will of Darkseid. That is it. No more, no less. That is how he survived the destruction of their planets. We're not like you scumbag. Besides... From what we know, you've already changed the way the world works, and you're scared of us. That's why you're here now, isn't it? Luther not even bothering to respond, as Bakugo begins to course electricity and power. Now, along with that, I want to say that the other lanterns are at least beginning to arrive. The ones that were at least local. There's currently something happening in the universe. Something unexplained. And it feels off. Since multiple space sectors are at least calling for help. Meaning that they're going to have to deploy most of their forces that way. As Sayako begins to make her way towards Brainiac, not Brainiac's ship. Towards Mongol's ship. 
May flying in along with Sarah. All of them arriving to confront Luther. As soon as Luther does see all of them, he is quite surprised. As soon as he does look away, Blocko takes his chance. Immediately just running to the left as fast as he can, and then bolting straight for Luther. Luther, he will not have enough time to look directly at him, meaning that he can get in and get a solid punch. As he does so, he immediately cocks back his arm, and holds an explosion net. As soon as he gets directly in front of Luther and throws out his hand, blasting it forwards, Lex Luther gets sent flying away. The suit he's in did not anticipate that. The suit was made to fight a Kryptonian. And Bakugo, surprise, surprise, he's not a Kryptonian. So, that's quite impressive. But I'll have to tell you this one thing, boy. You are not the Flash. Oh, really? As Bakugo says, standing up. Luther blinking, and Bakugo disappearing, and being directly behind him tapping on his shoulder as he throws out another punch, connecting it with Luther's suit. As Sophie in the Hellbat suit, along with the Sajam, and, surprise, surprise, everyone else, getting up on Lex Luther, planning to take him down. Now, back over in space, you do have Midoriya and Mongol still going at it, Mongol actually trying to beat on Midoriya, as the sword is beginning to com completely form armor around his body, covering his vital organs along with parts of his body that need to be protected, along with it actually covering his eyes. Midoriya just using X-ray vision to look through it, and fighting against Mongol. Now, with that being said, Mongol does actually get the upper hand for one second, punching directly into Midoriya as he does actually break forwards the helmets. Some of the metal begin to actually stab into his face. Midoriya taking a second to try and pull the metal out as fast as he can, trying to order it to get out of his skin. Mongol kicking him away as hard as he can, sending him towards deep space, as he does actually turn and go to fly towards the planets. He wants to take Midoriya somewhere where he can't let loose, where he needs to hold back. Midoriya throwing his hand outwards and immediately letting out his chains, as they try and chase Mongol down at high speeds. Mongol just looking behind him and creating walls, anything he can to slow down Midoriya, as he does arrive on the planets. Now, as soon as that does happen, Midoriya does actually go to fly that way. However, there is a weird sound, and he can hear it, as he himself does actually throw his hands up covering his ears, screaming out in pain, unsure of what that was, before a thought does actually run into his mind. Mongol is going to kill everyone on that planet. He's going to try and force me there just so I can't hold back. Shit. This is where it starts, isn't it? This is where our timeline, well, separates. <sighs> he wasn't supposed to be here for another two years, three at max, but that's just it. Okay, let's see. I need to throw something in here that won't be expected. But are you at least thinking before bringing his hand up? and radioing to Jiro that she needs to make sure Sophie gets this message, that she is listening. Tell Sophie that she needs to hold off Mongol, along with Sarah. They need to do whatever they can to hold him off. I'm going to take a bit of a, well, bath for a second, if you can call it that. Jiro trying to ask him what he's doing. Midoriya? closing the transmission, and looking back to see the giant floating star, and flying directly into it, 
as fast as he can. Now, with that being said, we do have Sophie, who has heard Midoriya's message, as she does actually look around, looking upwards into the air, seeing Mongol entering the atmosphere, as he's directly flying towards them. Her turning and just telling Sophie that her telling Sarah that they need to go in and get him. Make sure that he can't separate them. They need to hold him off until Dad does get his work done. Her at least nodding and blasting off that way. As she does fly in and directly throw a punch outwards towards Mongol, who throws his own outwards, countering her own. As soon as that does happen, he does actually bring his ring up and try to blast away at her with weapons. As she does actually take these blasts and throw herself away from Mongol. As Sophie comes barreling in, punching directly into him and sends him flying backwards. As these two begin to hold him off, fighting with him and trying to take him down. While Everyone else is fighting Luther, and Midori is sunbathing. Now, I do want to say that they are able to take down Lex Luthor. The team currently dealing with him. Since Sayako can link into and actually hack into Luther's technology. And shut it all down. Now, with that being said... That would take a bit of time, but she was already working on it. Apocalyptic tech is still different, so it did take a bit of time. Now, after that does happen, Shazam does fly in and actually punch into and try and fight with Mongol, as it's currently a 3v1. Now, with that being said, Mongol, he does actually rush towards this bat suit and directly goes to throw out a punch towards it. As Sarah begins to actually blast away at him, trying to hold him off and take him down. As Kirishima does actually fly in and directly try and throw a punch out towards him. As he does actually sock him away, as Sophie does actually try and go after him blasting at him with her heat vision. At least focusing on the fact that if they can't change things here, then her future is doomed. Her past is set in stone. And her actually being enraged by that statement. That being the only thought coursing through her mind. Now, with that being said, she is flying after Mongol and trying to fight after him as Sarah and Kirishima are flying after him too. Him making his way towards one of the cities, as he does actually crash land into the ground, look up and start looking around for civilians, and smiling as he begins to try and blast out as many constructs as he can, trying to at least in inspire fear in people. That being whenever Sophie does come in, and directly throw out a punch, smashing him into the ground. Sarah and Karishima looking on. As Karishima does at least state that that girl is very, very powerful, isn't she? What do you expect? She's Midoriya's kid. Fair enough. Karishima flying in. And throwing a punch towards Mongol, who catches his arm. And immediately starts pulling it backwards and trying to break his hand. Karishima actually feeling this, as he does actually throw his other hand, smashing directly in Mongol's face. Who doesn't even flinch, let alone move at that. As he just keeps trying to punch into his face over and over again while Mongol tries to break his arm. As Sarah comes bar barreling in, and smashes into his chest. As he does let go of Karishima, who immediately just tries to use his quirk. He's been trying to work on something in the past three years. He's always wondered. Magic and quirks. What happens when you mix the two? As he is able to successfully 
tap into his unbreakable mode. And, somewhat, try and fight back with Mongol, who tries to pull the same stunt again, however Karasim is actually able to claw into his arm. And the three are able to successfully hold him off. Until things go sideways. Mongol is able to smash into and actually begin to tear apart and rip away at the hell bat suit, meaning that Sarah is exposed. As he does actually bring his hand up and create a blade, going to directly stab into the suit. Karashima barreling in and smashing directly into Mongol. As he does basically tackle him and begin to go towards the ground. As Sophie flies in and catches the suit and flies her away, leaving Karashima to deal with Mongol for about 30 seconds. Well, let's cut over to Midoriya. He is hearing this. He heard the suit tear apart. He's heard everything. As he's just waiting, he's been in here for almost five minutes. He just needs a bit more time. Come on. I know you can all do it. Please. As he just begins to ponder, what if he can't do this? What if he can't save his world? If he can't kill Mongol, then what next? He's really going to have to do it, isn't he? Throw himself into the source wall? That's not something I want to do. That isn't my future. My future is with my wife and child. I will see her grow up. I will see her turn into that brave woman I saw today who's currently fighting that battle for me. She will have a father. Things will change. As Midori just begins to think, hearing the battle going on, hearing Mongol actually take down Kirishima, after about seven to eight more minutes, and it's only Sophie versus Mongol, her fighting back against him, and trying to take him down. Her being smacked around, and thrown around the city as if she's nothing. Mongol does want to take the heads of these heroes. However, Karashima does get back up, along with Sophie, trying to fight back. As one thing does happen. Whenever Mongol stands directly in front of her and does actually create a construct, he goes to throw it downwards. And the Flash comes barreling in, him smashing directly into Mongol and actually sh shoulder checking him as hard as he can. As Mongol gets sent flying away, Midoriya hearing that, as Bako just shouts that he bought him time. Now do whatever you're gonna do, Midoriya! As he somewhat does collapse onto the ground. He just broke his right arm and a few ribs, shoulder checking that guy somewhere around the speed of sound. If not, somewhere around faster than that. He's not too sure on the whole physics thing about it, nor does he want to do the science. As Midoriya leaves the sun, and is supercharged with power. As he looks directly at the planets, and moves forwards. In less than two seconds, he's already back at the back at the planets, and directly into the city. Mongol looking around and waiting. As he hears something enter the atmosphere. Hmm. So you're finally back. Everyone just looking up and waiting to see Midoriya fly in. However, there is something else. Something flies downwards, completely engulfed in the sun's rays. Whatever it is, it's blinding to look at as it sweeps down and directly punches into Mongol's chest. And flies upwards, taking him directly upwards into the air. Mongol actually looking on to see Midoriya, whose eyes are just pouring with UV light. Him throwing back his hand and trying to punch Midoriya directly in the face. As soon as the fist connects, Midoriya does not flinch, telling Mongol that he will burn, before piercing through his body with his heat vision, 
and going bright as he can, burning brighter, 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 before he goes completely supernova at this point. This dwarfed his solar flare by a large margin, and he is at the very top of the atmosphere. As he just begins to let out this power over and over and over. Everyone on the planet is being blinded by this, and they can't look upwards toward the sky. Whatever it is, it's not offering any, any sort of mercy. As Midoriya burns Mongol to a crisp. As he goes falling out of the sky. Midoriya's body in a one yellow lantern ring being the only things falling. Midoriya losing consciousness. As someone does appear. Jiro teleports to Midoriya, and directly flies in, grabbing him, and plucking him out of the air. As she does, go back towards the ground, arriving with him in her arms. Midoriya is completely coated in a suit of armor, and he's heavily exhausted himself. That was the brightest thing they've ever seen along with Sophie, who herself actually is looking around and trying to at least think for a second. That was it, right? It all worked out. But why am I still here? No, that means nothing changed, didn't it? Her getting a bit angry thinking that her timeline is set in stone and there was no way to change it anyway. But why does she keep having memory flashes then? Why isn't this possible? That being whenever Jiro just says that it's possible that it will take a minute. Give it some time. Now, that would be whenever Sarah would go on saying as she has actually walked forward that it's possible that you don't understand how it works. Besides, it takes time, no pun intended, sorry, for things to catch up. Don't you remember what happened with Brainiac a couple years ago? After, well, until he took his place, you took a minute. What was it? The next day, your past began to change. And Telly took Brainiac's place. She continued his mission. If your memories don't change by tomorrow, then that means that this event will still happen. Midori is still at risk of becoming Doomsday. Now, with that being said, everyone does have a few things to think about. Along with Sophie and Jiro heading back home as Midoriya is put in bed, and given time. Now, with that being said, Sophie does actually begin to think, looking back through her journal, trying to figure all of this out. Her timeline, everything lines up with it. Very few things part from this journal. But even then, why? It doesn't make sense. As she does actually head back towards the Hall of Justice, it means to try and think, looking through many different places. Now, with that being said, I do believe that that will be a good point to leave this off of. And I do hope you guys enjoyed. And I will catch you in the next part.